Hello folks, how's everybody doing out there? This week, our history of software and three-letter acronyms gets to E, and E is for EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. But more generally, it's a chance to look at some of the wider social and sociological implications of all the things we talked about so far. Our journey started with ACK, the fundamental mechanism that makes reliable computer networks possible, and moved through the BBC Micro, CPM, DOS, and brings us to the 1990s. Digital computers have gone mainstream. The IBM PC has spawned countless beige PC-compatible boxes, along with the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, Acorn Archimedes. Computers are a feature of homes and offices all over the developed world, and along the way they're starting to raise some interesting questions around things like copyright and ownership. Now, I've talked elsewhere about the history of free software, the confusion around what that term actually means, and the origins of things like shareware and open source. But I think the most important thing to realize is that for the first few decades of the information age, the idea of selling software was, well, it was kind of weird. The wave of standardization that followed CPM and Gary Kildall's BIOS chips hadn't happened yet. If you wanted to run a program on your computer, which would actually be the computer in your company or your university's laboratory, you'd get hold of the source code, probably make a few modifications to support the specific system and hardware you were building it for, compile it, install it, and then tell everyone else in the lab, hey, there's a new program available. In 1976, Bill Gates published the famous Open Letter to Hobbyists. He and Paul Allen had founded Microsoft a year before, and were still spelling Microsoft with a hyphen, and one of their first products was a version of BASIC for the Altair microcomputer, which computer enthusiasts were trading freely at computer club meetings, folks showing up with 25 copies of BASIC on paper tape, handing it out free to anybody who wanted a copy. I think Gates' letter might be the first recorded instance of somebody referring to unauthorized duplication of software as theft, and it foreshadows five decades of confusion around code, data, and how those things should be treated under law. In the US, the UK, and many other countries, theft has long been legally defined as appropriating property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. And it's obvious that if you copy Altair Basic off somebody, you're not permanently depriving them of it. They can use it. You can use it. It's a victimless crime. Uh, except the folks who spent a year developing Altair Basic, they did it because they expected to get paid. So maybe by copying it instead of buying it, you're depriving them of that revenue. Except maybe you'd never have bought it in the first place. This stuff was a mess in 1976, and it's a mess today. And I think fundamentally, that's because duplicating digital information is trivial. Every time you open a web page or download a file or listen to a podcast, you're creating a perfect digital copy. That's how computers work. Data getting copied is like water flowing downhill, despite the countless millions of hours that have been spent developing digital rights management systems intended to control and restrict this capability so that only paying customers can benefit from it. But digital computers and networks also opened up whole new fields of human endeavor that the law was hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with. Uh, this is John Draper, aka Captain Crunch. He's a man who would go down in tech history after he figured out that a toy plastic whistle given away in boxes of Captain Crunch cereal emitted a very specific audio frequency, 2600 hertz, that could be used to make free long distance phone calls. Now, stop there for a second. I want you to imagine trying to explain to a US police officer in the 1970s that somebody is stealing telephone calls using a plastic whistle that came in a cereal box. That sounds completely bizarre, right? How, how can you steal a telephone call? That's not even a thing. But in a sense, that's exactly what Draper was doing and was an early indicator of the confusion to come, as legal precedents and frameworks from the analog age would prove hopelessly inadequate when it came to computer crime and digital rights. Skip forward to 1990. The United States Secret Service had become aware that somebody was circulating illegal copies of a document explaining how the 911 emergency phone system worked, and was perhaps justifiably concerned that if hackers were using phone lines set aside for emergency calls, people with actual emergencies might be unable to call 911. 
One of the alleged recipients of the E911 document was a guy called Lloyd Blankenship, whose day job was working at a games book publisher in Texas called Steve Jackson Games. Yes, that Steve Jackson, for any of you folks who grew up with the fighting fantasy game books. The Secret Service raided their offices, confiscated all their computers, including the uh, master copies of their new role-playing game, Cyberpunk, which the Secret Service mistakenly believed was some kind of computer crime handbook. Three months later, the Secret Service concluded there wasn't actually any top-secret illegal material on any of the computers, and gave them all back. End of story? Far from it. Having all of their equipment confiscated for three months meant Steve Jackson games couldn't operate. They missed deadlines, they couldn't fulfill orders, and when the computers were finally returned, numerous files had been deleted. Worse than that, one of the confiscated computers had hosted a public bulletin board system. And so private citizens, who weren't employees of the company or in any way implicated in the investigation, had had their personal messages accessed, and in some cases deleted, by law enforcement. Steve Jackson went looking for a civil liberties group to help him sue the government, only to find no such group existed. But word of the situation reached Mitch Kapor, the creator of Lotus 123 and former president of the Lotus Corporation. Kapor rallied a few like-minded individuals. John Gilmore, who was employee number five at Sun Microsystems. Steve Wozniak, founding partner of Apple Computer, the designer of the Apple II microcomputer. And John Perry Barlow, a Wyoming cattle rancher who'd become involved in digital activism through his collaboration with the American rock band The Grateful Dead. Yes, I realize that makes absolutely no sense. Go look him up. His life story is absolutely astonishing. Four people who shared a strong libertarian ethos, who understood software and networks about as well as anybody else on the planet, and who, let's face it, had a lot of money. Like, a completely ridiculous amount of money. The kind of money that means you can afford to sue the United States Secret Service. And that's exactly what they did. They founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit established to defend digital privacy, free speech, and innovation. And their first case was Steve Jackson Games Incorporated versus the United States Secret Service. That case eventually came to trial in 1993. The court found in favor of Steve Jackson Games on two out of three counts, noting that the Secret Service had been sloppy in preparing their warrants, ill-educated regarding the relevant statutes, and had no basis to suspect any employees of Steve Jackson Games of any illegal activity. Most significantly, though, this case established the legal precedent that emails and bulletin board messages were entitled to the same legal protection as telephone calls and regular mail, and that law enforcement was not allowed to read citizens' private electronic correspondence without a very particular and specific warrant entitling them to do so. Five years later, Daniel J. Bernstein, a student at the University of California, wrote a paper describing a cryptography system called Snuffle. Some of you folks might have heard of Bernstein. Among other things, he created Qmail, a mail transfer agent that is probably one of the most reliable and secure pieces of network software ever created. When Bernstein released Qmail in 1997, he announced a $500 reward for the first person to find a verifiable security hole in Qmail. Ten years later, Qmail was released into the public domain. At that time, Bernstein confirmed that the software had a total of four known bugs, none of them constituted a security hole, and he was increasing the bounty to $1,000. Now, I ran my own Qmail server for nearly 20 years. In all that time, I don't remember ever having to restart Qmail, except when I'd made major config changes. It ran 24-7, never crashed, never hung. It was and is astonishingly good software. And you know the best part? Bernstein didn't even set out to create email software. Qmail only exists because way back in the mid-90s, he'd promised to run a large mailing list for a colleague and he didn't want to do it using SendMail. So he built his own mail software in about a year and just happened to build what is probably the most secure, reliable email software in history. Yeah, not bad. The other thing Dan Bernstein did in the 1990s was to go to the US government and ask how he'd go about publishing the paper and source code associated with his Snuffle crypto system. You see, in the 1990s, encryption software was classified as munitions, and exporting it from the United States was illegal without a munitions export license. And so, effectively, the US government was telling Bernstein he wasn't allowed to publish his research. 
That sort of preemptive censorship is called prior restraint. It's a violation of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Enter the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a four-year lawsuit and an eventual verdict by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that yes, software source code was free speech. Yes, it was protected by the First Amendment and that government regulations preventing the publication of source code were unconstitutional. Anytime you buy something online, download your email, do just about any of the things we all do every day as connected citizens in a digital society, you probably take it for granted that you and your data are safe. Safe in the technical sense that strong encryption prevents criminals from intercepting your credit card, and safe in the legal sense that your data belongs to you and nobody, not even the government, is allowed to read it, modify it, or delete it without your consent. At least that's the idea. How much of that is true depends on who you are, where you live, how you connect to the internet, and what you're doing with it. But for a lot of the folks out there who do enjoy those protections and liberties, that is largely thanks to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is still out there today working on everything from online age verification to whether the police should be using AI to help write case reports. And uh, as their strapline puts it, defending digital privacy, free speech, and innovation. The only other contender I really considered for E this week was the Enhanced Graphics Array, EGA, the 16-color system on the IBM PC. I decided not to go with EGA because, well, there's been enough old computer nostalgia over the past couple of episodes, and as much fun as it would have been to geek out over old PC games for 10 minutes, I thought maybe digital rights and free speech were more important. But then somebody told me about the Crimson Diamond. It's a game that was released on Steam in August this year. It's a text parser based adventure mystery game with EGA graphics. So if you do fancy a bit of a 16 color nostalgia trip, go and check that out. Folks, I'm gonna be at a bunch of conferences and events over the next few months. Next week, I'll be in Berlin at Kandinsky. 13th to 15th of November, I'm at Build Stuff in Vilnius, Lithuania. November 27th, I'm at Bussum in the Netherlands for SNIC's Sustainable IT Conference. And December 4th, I'm back in the Netherlands for the Tweakers Developer Summit in Utrecht. I'll put links to those in the description. If you're around at any of those, come and say hello. It would be lovely to meet you, and I'll probably be giving away stickers. In the next installment of the History of Software in Three-Letter Acronyms, F is for... I'm going to let this one be a surprise. So if you want to find out what F is for, tune in next time. Until then, folks, thank you, as always, for watching. You'll take it easy out there, look after each other, have a good week, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.